After one of the worst years for Intel and probably one of the most problematic processor generations in the long history of this prestigious company, our wait has ended and the new generation of processors is here. With a new architecture and name, we dared to have expectations. I believe everyone is aware that after the previous series screw-ups, this generation will decide their fate. The break with the past is also marked by the abandonment of the I, which has been an Intel trademark for years, as well as by the disappearance of long numbers that indicated the generation the processors belonged to. This new series is meant to be a reset, a new beginning which leaves behind the mistakes and controversies of the past. Unlike the last three generations, Intel has not just gone with a refresh of a refresh of an outdated manufacturing process, still from the initial launch in 2021. Even though the manufacturing process does not have great significance in the mind of the average user, physics dictates that a higher transistor density means lower power consumption and the possibility of increasing the number of transistors. And the manufacturing process that Intel has been reheating over the last few years, like the proverbial soup, was their Achilles heel. As long as Intel could brag in the press and wherever else with its unbeatable processors based on Intel 7 technology, which was actually a 10 nanometer manufacturing process, AMD went about their business and moved to 7 nanometer processors and recently even to 4 with the Ryzen 9000 series. This means a more than double transistor density compared to Intel processors, which although powerful, achieved performance through brute force, meaning high energy consumption. In the 11th hour, Intel, which had grand plans for new fabs in the United States to produce processors not just for itself but for others also, had to swallow its pride and turn to TSMC, its main rival in production, for essential elements of its new generation of processors. The Arrow Lake processors we are discussing today are the first desktop CPUs from Intel based on a chiplet design. This configuration separates the CPU units, integrated graphics and I.O. components. In short, because Intel is not able to produce smaller chips than before, Intel contracted TSMC to produce the main chip on their latest 3 nanometers technology, Intel manufacturing only certain components of the processor themselves. And this strategy, as humiliating as it might seem, is paying off. Arrow Lake also integrates a neural processing unit capable of up to 13 tops for AI tasks, increases in instructions per cycle compared to the 14th series are 15 to 25 percent, and Intel also boasts a significant reduction in power consumption. And something else important, which indicates once again a break with the past. Intel has abandoned hyper-threading in favor of more powerful e-cores, about 25-30 percent stronger than the previous generation. However, these fundamental changes also come with a disadvantage for the average user. The processors are no longer on the LGA1700 socket. This means that if you want to make the transition to a processor from the Intel Core Ultra 200 series, not only will you have to change the processor, but also the motherboard with a completely new one from the 800 series, based on the LGA1851 socket. Well, if this is the price to be paid for better processors, I for one, I'm willing to pay it. But the million dollar question here is this. Are the Arrow Lake processors really better than those from the 14 series? Well, let's find out, shall we? Ladies and gentlemen, here we have the most powerful model among the new processors, precisely the Intel Core Ultra 9 285K which comes with a total of 24 cores and just as many execution threads. It has up to 36 megabytes of smart cache and a base TDP of 125 watt, 250 PL2, with a base frequency of 3.7 GHz, which can reach up to 5.7 in turbo boost, a decrease of 300 MHz compared to the 6 GHz of the Core i9-14900K. In reality, this decrease isn't as significant as one might think. The 14900K could reach 6 GHz only in ideal conditions, for a short time and only on one or two cores. Most of the time, the processor ran single-core tasks at 5.8 GHz, and the architectural change makes this numerical difference even less relevant. Of course, the Core Ultra 9 285K is not the only model of this generation. 
and it might not even be the most important for the majority of users. The other two new releases from this series are the Core Ultra 7 and Core Ultra 5, namely the 265K and 245K respectively. The first of these, the Core Ultra 7 model, comes with 20 cores, with 8P cores and 12E cores, being the successor of the 14700K. Unlike the 36 megabytes of smart cache of the Ultra 9, the Core Ultra 7 265K has only 30 megabytes and a more balanced maximum frequency of 5.5 GHz, the base being 3.9. This is the mid-range processor positioned between the budget-friendly 245K and the top-of-the-range 285K. The retail price of the Ultra 7 is about $400 which is not bad at all when compared with the $600 or slightly more asked for the 285K. As an aside, the pricing of these new processors isn't radically different from the previous generation. We're talking about a slight increase, but prices will soon stabilize at values probably similar to those of the previous generation. The last of the three processors, the 245K, has only 14 cores with 6P cores and 8E cores, with just as many execution threads and with 24 megabytes of smart cache. The base frequency of the successor of the 14600K is 4.2 GHz, while the turbo boost frequency reaches 5.2. As I mentioned before, this processor is aimed at gamers and generally users who do not need a rocket for a CPU. The price reflects this. It has a recommended price of just over $300 a sum almost accessible to most potential clients. Here is a table with specifications in case you want to analyze it in more detail. Ok, before we move on to the tests, I want to talk a little about the rest of the system that I used for testing. For those who know what our test platform usually contains, I can tell you only this. It remains only the power supply and the case, because everything else has been changed for this launch. Asus are the ones who provided a new testbed and what an ensemble. A spectacularly packaged kit consisting of motherboard, memory, cooling system and of course the 285K processor. The motherboard is an ROG Maximus Z890 Hero, considered by many one of the best options for the new generation of processors. Even though it does not represent the pinnacle of ROG, a title that belongs to the Maximus Z890 Extreme, it is still a top motherboard for the LGA1851 platform. At first glance, this motherboard looks like it came straight out of Cyberpunk with many straight angles and RGB lights that will urgently transform your PC into a Christmas tree, now that the holidays are approaching. The VRM cooling is exceptional and, as expected, it has a ton of expansion slots and features that made me drool more than Pavlov's dog at the sight of food. How many slots? Well, it has 6 M2s for SSD mounting, PCI Express X16, a PCI Express X1, power buttons directly on the board and plenty of other features. The Wi-Fi 7 antenna comes with a push-click mounting system, which I really like, and there are plenty of small details that deserve their own piece in the future. The memory is a Kingston Fury Renegade kit, which, theoretically speaking, can function even at 8400 mega transfers per second, but which I managed to keep stable only after setting it to 8200 mega transfers per second. And if you're wondering about these astronomical frequencies, the received memories are quite new. The Kudim memories, specially launched for the new generation of motherboards, include a frequency management chip integrated directly on the memory module. This clock driver helps maintain signal integrity between the memory controller and the memory chips, allowing the achievement of such speeds without completely depending on the capabilities of the processor's integrated memory controller. The cooler used here is the ROG Ryujin 3 360 ARGB Extreme, the latest revision of the already classic Ryujin, a true beast in terms of cooling. This cooler was specifically designed for the new generation of processors, whether we're talking about Intel or AMD, and comes with several substantial changes from the previous revisions. If we talk strictly about the LGA1851 platform, the mounting modifications are quite minor. In fact, the mounting holes for LGA1700 align perfectly with those for LGA1851. Only that, on the new platform, the entire processor socket is moved a few millimeters to the right and up, so a cooler adapted for LGA1700 will not fit perfectly on the new processors. This is half bad news. 
For existing coolers on the market, only a mounting kit that shifts the cooler's base is needed, not one that completely changes the mounting. Aesthetically, the first change I noticed on the Ryujin 3 360A RGB Extreme Cooler is that the fan blades are now connected at the edges, forming a circle which seemed quite interesting to me and appears to add an extra level of resistance to vibration. Also, the RGB is only on the blades and motor, so it's completely absent from the frame. Neither does the magnetic daisy chain system of the fans leave anything to be desired. The same goes for the connectivity and accessories included in the cooler package. About the rest of the components, there isn't much to say. The Corsair MP700 SSD is incredibly fast and has performed efficiently. The Be Quiet power supply is the one we always use for the test platform. And about the RTX 4090 Founders Edition, there's nothing more to say, because everyone already knows what it's about. Before we move on to the tests, I need to add a brief aside about our expectations regarding these processor launches. Moore's law stated that the number of transistors in an integrated circuit would double approximately every two years, which leads to an increase in processing power and a decrease in costs per transistor. But Gordon Moore, co-founder of Intel, formulated this observation in 1965. Times have changed. Due to the limitations and increasing complexity of the manufacturing process intended to reduce the size of transistors, the pace predicted by this law has started to slow down in recent years. So, I'm afraid that expectations of performance increases in the two-digit percentage range, like 15-20% in tests, are completely unrealistic. Sure, emotionally speaking, I too am frustrated by single-digit progress. See the Zen 5 launch, but I don't think the manufacturers are to blame. It's about the physical limits of miniaturization. However, as Philip Kotler, a pioneer in the field of marketing, said, there is no such thing as a bad product, only a wrong price. And if you have a product that doesn't offer more performance per dollar spent, then we already have a big problem. And now that I've given you more context, it's time to see how this brand new Core Ultra 9 285K, the top of the line of this Intel generation, performs when put to work. The first tests I ran were Cinebench R23 and R20, and in Cinebench R23 I scored no less than 43,106 points in the multi-core test and 2,361 in the single-core test. This translates to an improvement of over 13% in multi-core compared to the 37,776 points scored by the 14,900K last time I tested it, after the recent limitations that somewhat slowed it down. The difference from the Ryzen 9 9950X is considerably smaller, only 4%, as at the time of its launch it scored 41,382 points in the same test. Even after a 10-minute stress test, the Core Ultra 9 285K performs better than the other two models at peak, with a score of 41,953 points. This means that the difference between the peak performance of the Core Ultra 285K and those achieved after 10 minutes of absolute stress is less than 3%, which is not bad at all. In terms of single core, the Core Ultra 9 285K is 5% better than the 14900K was at launch, and approximately 4.3% better than the Ryzen 9 9950X, scoring 2245 points versus 2262 in the case of the AMD model. In Cinebench R20, the final score was 16875 multi-core points and 1905 single core point, which still places it ahead compared to the other two models, the already old 14900K and the new Ryzen 9 9950X. Considering these figures, I think it's quite clear that we are dealing with a new champion in terms of productivity in the consumer segment, dethroning the Ryzen 9 9950X after just a few months of rain. Keep in mind that we didn't have much time to optimize the platform and Intel boasts even higher scores in single core. I can't say I was disappointed with the temperature and power consumption either, because now some coherent and sensible limits have been imposed. And even though we are still dealing with a slightly higher consumption than AMD's flagship, I consider that we are within normal parameters. But I have another mention here. Even though we didn't have this problem, there have been cases of people with the same motherboard 
and the OCCT was showing that the processor was consuming 190 watts even when it was in full load, which is because on this motherboard the processor doesn't draw all its power in a conventional way, though the dedicated 8-pin cables, but it also takes part of it through the 24-pin connector on the motherboard. The people at Gamers Nexus managed to isolate the processor's consumption from the rest of the system, and they were the ones who discovered this peculiarity present on this Asus motherboard. Analyzing the results, although it does not have the same energy efficiency as the Ryzen processors, I say things have improved significantly, both from this point of view and from the perspective of temperatures. Gone are the days when you couldn't run an Intel processor that wouldn't constantly be at 100 degrees Celsius in full load, even with a strong liquid cooler. Now temperatures barely exceeded 75 degrees in full load, and that was just for a few moments, and those didn't last more than a few seconds. I therefore consider that the decision to abandon outdated manufacturing technology and pride brings progress that Intel desperately needed. And now we move on to the part that I know many are already looking forward to, namely how the new Intel processor fares in games. I'll tell you right off the bat, the 285K is not a processor that will revolutionize gaming. Even Intel has stated that progress in gaming will be non-existent compared to the 14900K, the advantages being more visible on the productivity side. For this reason, for the gaming tests at launch, I only chose two titles, but weighty ones. Red Dead Redemption 2 and Cyberpunk 2077. In the first title on the list, Red Dead Redemption 2, at QHD resolution with graphics maxed out, I achieved an average of 173 frames per second, which places the Core Ultra 9 285K both below the i9 14900K and the Ryzen 9 9950X, which scored an average FPS slightly higher by just a few frames. At 1080p resolution, with the same graphic preset as before, the frame rate increased, though not as much as I expected, to 195 FPS. The 12% increase was, however, enough to outperform the other two processors, which is commendable because the differences in processor capabilities are best seen at lower resolutions. In the included benchmark from Cyberpunk 2077 at QHD resolution, ultra graphic preset without DLSS, I achieved no less than 145 frames, exactly the same value as the Ryzen 9 9950X and just one frame more than the 14900K. When I activated ray tracing, set it to ultra and put DLSS on balanced without frame generation and other enhancements, the frames dropped to 111, which ironically places the processor both behind the 9950X and behind the i9 14900K. I think this is one of the best proofs showing how small the differences are between processor generations and how you will not see a big difference in gaming if you switch from an i9 14900K to an Ultra 9 285K. Moreover, you might experience lower frame rates in some situations. But pay close attention here. This doesn't mean that the 285K is not an extremely good processor for gaming, because it is. Intel also boasts about something called APO, Application Optimization, a technology they recently launched, aimed at optimizing performance in games and applications running on Intel processors from generations 12, 13, 14 and the new Arrow Lake series. APO works by optimizing thread allocations with the help of Intel Thread Director, adjusting how certain games utilize performance cores, those piggers, and efficiency cores. It's an optimization similar to what AMD uses for their X3D processors, but at least currently, the performance gains achieved here by activating this feature seemed non-existent to me. In conclusion, I would not recommend the 285K to someone who wants to build a dedicated gaming PC, because it is not the best option. If you are set on Intel, you can safely choose a 14900K, which, after solving its issues, presents a similar level of performance, but a significantly lower price. We will revisit the gaming topic once the new AMD X3D processors are launched in the coming weeks, so to be continued. And now, let's draw some conclusions. What can be said about the 285K, summarizing what we have seen so far? I think it is a top-of-the-line processor that does everything it needs to do. It corrects the mistakes of previous generations and brings a performance boost, 
even if it seems small to many people's expectations. Yes, Moore's Law is dead and nothing can resurrect it at the moment, but that does not mean you should not buy a top-of-the-line processor. It also depends very much on what your expectations are. The overwhelming majority of users judge processors strictly from the perspective of brute performance. I personally believe that other aspects also matter, like stability, temperatures, reliability, and so on. And in this particular case of this particular Intel CPU, there was still something important about this processor. You can accuse me of cynicism, but my expectations were that this processor should just work. After how many sleepless nights I spent because of the 14900K, I just won the new 285K to deliver the promised level of performance, minus the problems of the last two generations. That remains to be verified over time. Finally, I will also answer the question I'm sure I will receive in the comments regarding upgrading. If you have an i9-14900K in your home PC and you are thinking about a possible upgrade, whether because you're worried that your processor might be outdated or because you just want the latest tech, my advice is to wait a bit. The performance gains that you are likely to experience are not substantial enough to justify the investment at this time, not unless you have specific needs that only the very latest processor models can meet. Yes, the 9950X is more energy efficient, but the Intel processor is slightly faster in most cases. However, Intel's victory is Pyrrhic. The situation is not as balanced for gamers, for whom I still recommend, without hesitation, the old 7800X3D, at least until we see what surprises the new X3D series will bring soon. At this moment, the 7800X3D is the most efficient and cost-effective gaming processor, and the eagerly awaited launch of the next generation of X3D CPUs will only place the 7800X3D in the second place. It's not clear to many that the 7800X3D will not become obsolete or morally worn out when the 9800X3D launches, even anticipating a performance increase of, let's say, 10%. What is certain is that the new models will make the 7800X3D even more attractive price-wise. Returning to our Arrow Lake, it's not the most impressive launch. It hasn't taken technology to a new level, nor has it made older processors irrelevant. But if we look over the fence at Zen 5, said to be Zen 5%, <laughs> we see that the problem isn't one that affects a specific processor manufacturer, but rather the state of technology at this moment. That's all that could be done. We currently don't have a way to further reduce the manufacturing process, and I know this doesn't sound too good, but at the moment, a launch that is just okay is still better than what we have received so far from Intel. And now, let me hear you in the comments. So, what do you think of the new series of processors from Intel in general and about the 285K, the new flagship in particular? Are you planning an upgrade or not? And if so, from which model? I'm really curious about your opinion in the comments section below. And with that being said, we'll stop here. That's it for today. And if you made it this far, hit that subscribe button. Thanks and good luck to you all.